Great. Um, so I'm delighted to uh, be here to um, give this short talk about um, perspectives on the future of evidence synthesis in my role as editor in chief of the Camel Collaboration uh, for the SMAR conference. So first, I just want to declare my uh, interests. Uh, I have a main role as Editor-in-Chief of Campbell Collaboration. I'm also involved in various Cochrane groups and I've had funding from CIHR, WHO, and NIHR, um, not for this talk. So why do we need evidence synthesis? I think you've, uh, you're probably all converted and some of you may have seen this quote, professional intentions are uh, not sufficient for selecting policies. Actually, well-intentioned interventions can cause more harm than good. Uh, scared straight programs are one example of this uh, from Campbell Systematic Reviews where uh, juvenile delinquents um, are exposed to prison um, and this actually resulted in more crime. In the social sector, uh, almost 80% of programs don't work. Um, so we need evidence synthesis so we can identify those that do work, identify um, how they work and in which circumstances and for which populations, and also how to make them work better. So evidence synthesis is a way to bring together everything we know on one question. Third reason for evidence synthesis um, is collecting all available evidence. Uh, if we didn't do this, we could make the wrong conclusion. The Cochrane logo is a perfect example of this, um, where in 1972, this is, a, this is a logo which shows a meta-analysis of corticosteroids for women about to deliver prematurely. And um, the in the logo, each line represents a single study. And its confidence intervals. In 1972, the first trial showed a, uh, an effect on mortality, but subsequent trials, and you can see these in the middle, uh, actually uh, showed not statistically significant effects. Um, and when meta-analysis was finally done in 1991, uh, this showed a 30 to 50% reduction in mortality of children. So where are we now uh, with systematic reviews? Um, some of you may have seen this slide by John Ioannidis. Uh, there are many, many, many systematic reviews and meta-analyses, uh, often on the same topic and with different findings. Uh, just as a more recent example, hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19, uh, which we know is not effective, has over 176 reviews, and that's just in the last year. And this is from the epistemological database. So what do I think about the future of evidence synthesis? I think we need to think about four things, uh, timeliness, replicability, stakeholder engagement, and the evidence ecosystem. So first, when we think about timely, the time to publication of Cocker reviews um, was 1.63 years. Uh, for Campbell, it's about the same. A quarter of reviews uh, are not published after seven years, and it takes almost three years for uh, updates to happen. Um, so how can we how can we improve? Uh, I think most of you again are the converted. Um, there are many ways to bring automation into systematic reviews, um, as well as crowdsourcing to bring many hands to bear. Uh, James Thomas from the Epicenter uh, published this um, article three years ago on how automation could be used in each step of systematic reviews. Um, this has obviously moved on since uh, this article. Um, in Campbell, we're working on evidence and gap maps, which are uh, a map of all the evidence. Each of the circles in this uh, graph represents uh, studies or systematic reviews uh, on homelessness. And um, this map was actually used to complete three systematic reviews in less than a year, um, just by making all of the studies discoverable. Um, one example is a review on discharge planning for people who are homeless. So, Future-proofing timeliness, uh, Campbell's working on evidence and gap maps. 
We're also looking at a policy paper with Evidence Synthesis International to bring together the different organizations that um, do evidence synthesis. And the hackathon, and I want to go through this with each of my um, topic areas, the hackathon is working on connected tools in R to expedite and make reviews more efficient. Replicability. Most of you will have heard about the reproducibility crisis. Um, this is pretty old now, six years, but we still have this issue, uh, especially in the social sector. Replicability of primary studies uh, is an issue. But what about systematic reviews? Um, um, myself and colleagues uh, led a paper on when to replicate or not replicate systematic reviews. And uh, through a consensus and uh, evidence-driven process, we came up with four criteria. The first, that they need to be high priority. The second, that they will have an impact on changing uncertainty about the decision. The third, that they will have a large population impact, and that could be benefit or harm. And the last, that opportunity costs outweigh um, uh, other things that could be done with the time and resources. Uh, another way to think about replicability in systematic reviews is how do we make our reviews more open? And uh, you'll probably hear more about this from Neil Hathaway. Um, this is his framework for open synthesis um, that we need to think about much more than just sharing data, but also um, open discovery, open methods, open source, open code, open peer review, and open education. Um, so what are we doing for future proofing? In Campbell, we're encouraging open synthesis um, and hoping to move to expecting data sharing this year. In the hackathon, um, we held in 2019 a series of discussions about how to promote open practices um, with academic incentives uh, for both primary studies and for systematic reviews. Stakeholder engagement. Um, again, you've probably heard a lot about this. Um, there are many levels of stakeholder engagement, but um, co-production remains at the at the top. Um, in systematic reviews, we're often thinking so much about the details of getting the review done. Um, we sometimes uh, fail to include the people who uh, are affected by the review questions. Um, so in Campbell, we currently require stakeholder engagement in the development of our evidence and gap maps, um, especially in the development of the framework of the outcomes and the interventions that are important for stakeholders. Um, we're, we also have four systematic reviews registered on how to engage stakeholders and the impact of engagement on systematic review outcomes. In uh, the hackathon, um, there is work ongoing to support engagement such as crowdsourcing. Uh, especially for screening and uh, data collection steps. Last, I just want to raise this issue of evidence ecosystem. I'm sure you'll discuss this in um, the, the conference. We think about the evidence ecosystem, it's beyond just systematic reviews. We also have the public that uses reviews, we have the primary studies, um, and we have other things which um, uh, um, that, um, collate the findings of the reviews, so guidelines and checklists and portals. Uh, at the hackathon in 2019, we uh, carried out some foresight planning about the ecosystem and how to improve it and how to stave off some of the possible negative future scenarios. Um, and this is a uh, report we published uh, last year in Nature, led by Shinichi Nakagawa. And, um, you can see that we have the public, the stakeholders, at the beginning and the end of the process. And um, we also think about how do we um, make the primary research more available for synthesis? How do we make the synthesis more available for the public? Um, another way of thinking about the ecosystem is um, systematic reviews are part of a bigger picture, and in this uh, pyramid that Howard White developed, uh, he's the CEO of the Camel Collaboration, systematic reviews are pretty low down in this pyramid. Um, and what he postulates in his paper is that uh, decision makers actually need more, synth more um, uh, packaged evidence. So things like evidence portals, guidelines, and checklists, which tell decision makers 
um, what the evidence, uh, the policy implications of the evidence are. And so um, we can't stop at systematic reviews. So one example of a portal is this uh, Education Endowment Foundation portal, the Teaching and Learning Toolkit, which has boiled down systematic reviews into three numbers, uh, cost from one to five, evidence strength from one to five, and impact in months of education. And you can see how this would be immediately very appealing to decision makers, um, but it's extremely uh, labor intensive for the toolkit developers to uh, come up with a formulae to um, summarize these numbers. So what are we doing for the ecosystem? In Campbell, we're building links with portals such as the Education Endowment Foundation so that it's built on rigorous systematic reviews. Um, we're also exploring guideline development in the social sectors. What do we do at the hackathon? We looked at foresight planning about how to improve those links across the ecosystem. So the future of evidence synthesis, I think we have uh, an agenda of improving timeliness, replicability, engaging with stakeholders and um, thinking of our role in the evidence ecosystem. And I hope that you'll join uh, all of us in the evidence revolution of uh, taking these steps together. Um, the hackathon is one way. Um, we'd also really invite you to join uh, Campbell and decision makers at the What Works Global Summit, which will be held online in October 2021.